You're listening to Razor Riffs with Keith Razor and Alan Lee right here on LA Talk Radio. Hey guys, welcome to the show. I'm Keith Razor with my trusty sidekick, Alan Lee, who's rushing to put on his headphones. It doesn't look like he's rushing. It looks like he's trying to figure yeah, them out. I like know. It's, it's like he was first being introduced <laughs> to them or whatever. Were you frozen in an, in an iceberg for a while and then discovered by some high school kids? Yes, a decade. Okay, it was good. He's only done 100 episodes. So it's 70. 101's the charm. That's what my grandfather there you said go. Yeah, when, he, it was the 70s. when he died at 99. Um, <laughs> And then uh, we have our guest, the great Hal Sparks, yes, that's right. in studio. How are right you, man? I'm spectacular, there but I'll go. get better, uh, you know. Yeah. There you go. yeah. Uh, how is traffic? Because I was getting a heart attack. I was like, oh, my God, oh, where's Hal? Dude, Dude, it's L.A. It's, yeah. really it's, uh, it's off and on. I um, I mean, it's always a multitude of factors in my life beyond just traffic itself. Yeah. You know, yeah, this, we live in a stackable society, Incredibly. so there's always so. something... Um, on top of it, and uh, not the least of which is that I do a I, I FaceTime with my kid yeah. um, every Thursday, yeah. and so that always pushes whatever I'm doing until we're until he decides sure. we're done. Yeah. So life always gets that. You know, I try to put as much pad on it as possible in life, but it doesn't always exist, and I'm never going to cut him off. Yeah, because he's eight, and oh, and yeah. he's my son. He, I love him. So eight's a good all, age. All else. Goes yeah, to the wayside. They're all good ages. Yeah. Like anybody who gripes about any age their kid is <laughs> can go pound sand. <laughs> now, do you live in L.A. or Vegas? Both. Both? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, um, my my girl and I have a house in Vegas, and then I live in L.A. too. Um, I have a place here. Mainly because you know it's it, you know it's like commuting to a steel town for work. It's mm-hmm. uh, you know mm-hmm. it's it's the main city in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, though, uh, I mean I. <laughs> The, the industry had been shifting quite a bit anyways, but right. I think, like, coronavirus is pushing everybody in a direction of, like, how can we telecommute all of life? Like, we're all going to be <laughs> yeah. in, like, <laughs> in, like, in these... Like, like columns full of water, uh, you know, with a respirator put in us, <laughs> directing, you know, <laughs> communications through our eyeball oh, blinks, you know. Yeah. Like, Are you scared of this coronavirus? I'm very concerned. I'm yeah. not scared of it. It's not mm-hmm. um, diminishing my behavior, but I'm very aware... Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. if you're relatively healthy and you're not worried about your your like, I feel like I can weather it. Most of the people in my age range can weather it. There's mm-hmm. some rare exceptions, but that's the main thing. The problem is passing it on to people who can't, and you don't want to be the domino, oh. right? And so the thing that concerns me, and why you should wash your hands and mm-hmm. cough and sneeze into your elbow and be an mm-hmm. adult, is um, and by the way, Purell does not help with viruses. That's for bacteria, yeah, and they think mm-hmm. it does. No, it doesn't. Yeah. You have to. Um, there's a fatty outer coating to viral viral uh, cells, mm-hmm. and they. Mm-hmm. The only thing that gets rid of them is soap and water. Yeah. You, you, you have to do that. Um, that's you ever seen a, a, a somebody scrub up before surgery? Mm-hmm. That's why awesome. they're doing it. Yeah. If they could just Purell before surgery and it wasn't a problem, they just mm-hmm. do that. But it's a very specific thing. Mm-hmm. So I just don't want to be that domino. I don't right. want to give it to somebody who gives oh, it to somebody dear. who gives it to somebody who cool. gives it to somebody who uh, can't fight it off. Yeah. And having spent a lot of time in China over the last couple of years. Oh. Um, I know for a fact that the numbers coming out of there were soft intentionally, that the threat is way higher, mm-hmm. um, probably by a factor of 10. Wow. That uh, scares me, too. Yeah. It's 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 not small. They're not rolling in mobile crematoriums to yeah. deal with that kind of, to deal with, the you know, six out of a thousand. Yeah. So if there's six U.S. cases, there's probably like 40 times that. Right. Yeah, something in that order. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of people who have it who will pass through it, um, and it Carriers. won't be that severe. Yeah, they'll but they'll carry it to somebody else. P- the problem is, and the part that concerns me the most is the the diabetics, for whatever reason, are in, are an in incredible danger from it because yeah. of other aspects. And we have a huge diabetes problem in the United States. So most people think, well, I don't really get the flu. I'm not really worried about my lungs. I don't. I don't get. I'm, I haven't gotten pneumonia, bronchitis, well, any shit like that. Huh? Pre-diabetic. Yeah. Well, that's. Um, well, aren't we all? Yeah, some I just, degree, that's, right? that's what that's um, But <laughs> true. But the idea being that all the diabetics in this country, the obesity epidemic we have in this country, oh, massively affects who can be affected by this. Right. Massively. And that's my concern. You know what I mean? The cascading effect of that. Because people, so, who, yeah, with a taxed immune system, don't need another thing, uh, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. 
So I have this uh, weird question for it. Uh, between me and Alan. Prove it. Yeah. Between <laughs> me will. and Alan, who do you think will will get it first? Oh, Jesus. Oh, I, I, <laughs> of course it would be me, right? Um, I don't know. Have you ever smoked? Never. Either of you? No. no. Okay. Vaped? Excuse me? Vaped? Nope. No. Okay. So no, you're not smokers or vapors. No. no. You live in, how long have you lived in L.A.? Uh, I actually live in Huntington Beach. Okay, but the general L.A. Oh, area. Oh, uh, yeah. my whole life. Okay, all right. How old are you? I just turned 33. Oh, okay, cool. And you? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, your whole life, basically, though? Oh, he doesn't well, like I, talking I, about his age. Understood. I, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Point well, being is that I'm just as, like figuring on yes, how sir. much po- pollution yeah. you've had to deal with over yeah. the course of your mm-hmm. life. Yeah. I'll be and, here for 30 years. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, so the air got better here yeah it did about 25 years and ago. by the airport believe it or not if you read the record it's it's one of the cleanest airs in that because it, it blows yeah. a certain way even though planes are coming mm-hmm. in but the one of the cases are, are at the airport mm-hmm. because obviously the traffic well, is trap. coming in yeah that, so i live near where people land mm-hmm. and see right? that that's why we carpool like we usually carpool but today i, I drove myself you're right because you don't want to touch him <laughs> you're just yeah I for those fine, of you out just listening to this me. and there's no cameras it in here fine. you don't realize that they're both wearing hazmat suits <laughs> And there's a giant wall between the two of them or whatever. And there's they've apparently filled out some sort of contract they went back and forth on about who can touch who and when. Well, I so w- it's I very want, weird. I, I, don't, want, I wanted to get one of your suits from Dude Where's My Car. Yeah, but they're, I mean, they, that won't help you. The sleeves, the hands are open, the feet are open. There's a The, the hood is, and not everybody gets a hood. I'm the only one with a hood. Yeah. The, there's a reason why I'm the leader of the cult. I get a purple hood. Everybody else is just, you know, and those the funny thing about those suits is they're basically like a weight loss suit from the 1950s. Oh. <laughs> Everybody was sweating to death. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. No, a question I had about that movie, which since we're on that subject, mm-hmm. but um, do you think that, uh, like, everyone loves The Hangover, but do you think Dude Where's My Car was like The Hangover before The Hangover? Of course. You know what I mean? I mean, it was the, I mean mm-hmm. you could almost track so. legalization of weed in the United States <laughs> to Dude Where's My Car. Yeah. Honestly. True. Like, there was, a, there was a tipping point where that movie was just so comforting to people who were, you know, between that and Half Baked, you know, those two movies did more for like, dude, it's pot, it's not heroin, get over it. Yeah. You know what I mean? That era was ushered in. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess you guys all owe philip stark a, a gram of something or other i don't i don't you know, the funny thing is i don't smoke or do drugs yeah. i never have yeah, i'm i'm uh i'm straight edge yeah I'm, have been my whole life yeah. so that's always amusing and now does that like really help your comedy because i know guys like they'll drink to make their comedy funnier you know what i mean well they think so yeah um that's not usually the case oh right um, usually, it, like it, Ron White, he always has scotch. But that's part of his whole yeah. Whole ethos. But he's uh, always drinking the scotch. Uh, yes. Not anymore. It's tequila. That's I right. Had, I was a barker. That's right. Screaming out in the that's street. Right. Well, and he, you know, he was Ron White's assistant for he, two days, and he yeah. and he sips it on stage. It's a very distinct difference from <laughs> yeah, being drunk that's on right. stage. Just, yeah. It's an image it's thing. A it's like Michael it's Anthony coming out with a bottle of. Whiskey that was actually iced tea. Yeah, you know, remember, like, if you watch, ever watched the old Van Halen shows? He'd come out, and, you know, playing his bass, yeah, old, pouring, just, just, uh, pouring whiskey on himself out of a, a you know, a bottle right. or fifth or whatever, and it's like it's iced tea, dude. You, he doesn't smell like liquor oh. after the show. Let's not. Kid I always ourselves. thought it was liquor. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> like D Martin. D Martin was a drink. Oh, he was totally yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, well, yeah. well, because of that, like, it must have been fun. I mean, I know yeah. the, I mean, the I don't, weed wasn't in a Everybody's acting. Character. I mean, yeah. that's true of everything. That's you know true. what I mean? I don't think anybody on Silence of the Lambs actually ate human flesh during the entire <laughs> shooting or whatever. I don't want to, if somebody was method yeah. and we found out later, I don't want to <laughs> diss their, their system. No, very, very strong yeah, if they method flew people. down to South America <laughs> and hung out in a, in a weird tribe oh. eating long pig, that's up to them. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, that's the interesting thing about even drugs in the music industry, which have been attributed mm-hmm. to a lot of creativity and the yes. like. And the reality yes, is, I, I, when you make and record a song over time, like the amount of work and oh, re-listening yeah, and yeah. replaying parts over and over, mm-hmm. that a lot of you're like, oh, Hendrix must have been fucking freaking baked all right. the time. Um, no, <laughs> not really. No. I mean, he smoked when he was yeah. in his own thing. He yeah. used it socially. Right. But a lot of times when he was working... He was pretty it, sober. And it was way more illegal and way harder to get, mm-hmm. you know, when you were traveling around. So it was less of a factor. You know, people mm-hmm. kind of rewrite history based on present yeah. day reality. Now, what's that like? Because you also do music besides being a great stand up. Like, how, how does that like 
Because I've seen your stand up, I've never seen your music. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, you know? but how does yeah. your mind get creative on like that? They're, I mean, they're wholly different. Mm-hmm. I've, uh, I've always felt like you need to be a complete person. You need complete outlets in yeah. your life. You know, and as a, there are certain emotions that do not belong in certain art forms. Right. Like I think you can do annoyance in stand up, and it's funny. Right. Rage in stand up is too heavy and too ugly. Right. You so, can do faux rage, but that's still annoyance. You're annoyed at something, so you exaggerate it like, you know, Sam Lewis Kinnison. Black or Kennison. Right. They're not really enraged. Rage. It's comedy it's rage. That's right. 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 But genuine rage, if you ever see somebody lose it on stage oh. or like the old... Like when, Michael Richards? Well, or Bill, <laughs> oh, or Bill Hicks when he got <laughs> mad that, a couple yeah, times. That's not nice. You yeah. know? Yeah. Those are, mm. those are areas where it yeah. just doesn't fit. It mm-hmm. branches over into a different thing. Yeah. Rage in music is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's mm-hmm. genuine yeah. and it belongs. I mean, metal exists mm-hmm. because of that, you know. Mm-hmm. And but annoyance seems petty mm-hmm. in music, okay. and cute, right? Um, right. And, and in acting, you can do everything. Mm-hmm. You can have every emotion. You can use every aspect of your life. Mm-hmm. But you don't get to choose when, right? Like if I come into work one day and I'm like, "Hey, I'm feeling happy today. Let's shoot happy." Like. What does that have to do with anything? The script says angry. We're doing angry That's today, right. dude. Right. You do what's there That's and what we're, you know, what we're creating that day. You don't get a choice. So in the other art forms, I get a choice of where I put my emotions, where I put my creativity. So all my annoyances and my pettiness and my, uh, you know, sort of obtuse observations about life go into stand up, and then all my genuine sorrow and anger and um, emotional distraught elements of my personality go into that right. you know or even my my force of nature like mm-hmm. you can put mm-hmm. like you know i went and saw kiss last night oh. at the staples center oh, it's like their kiss. last tour right yeah well oh, God, but it's kiss. they call it the end of the road tour which, which should be called the beginning of the residencies because that's what it's going to be like <laughs> right. they get used to the idea of them in vegas for three months at a time them in london for a, a month at a time it's going to be a different world for touring bands anyways in the future mm-hmm. as shows get bigger and bigger mm-hmm. so you'll go to the o2 not to see who's there that week but who's there all month Right, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Like, mm-hmm. like you would go see Cirque du Soleil. That's oh, that's yes. the way that's touring is going yeah. for big, big mm-hmm. bands, anyways. Because mm-hmm. people would rather fly to that place mm-hmm. and see them at the price than hope they come through town right. these days with that's an great. enormous oh, production. Wow. Yeah, now, so, great I know you do theaters with your stand up, but uh, mm-hmm. do you do theaters with your music too? And mm-hmm. what what's that like vibe like? Well, I do mainly like rock clubs musically. Um, like my band, like I'm also in a Van Halen cover band called Nerd Halen. Okay, and we're doing PDs in Tarzana tomorrow night, for example. Nice. Um, and you know that place is. Uh, it's a solid rock bar you know i do the whiskey for the ultimate jam night with great regularity i'm there almost every other tuesday doing the jam night there um and singing you know everything from like rat and skid row to uh you know to genesis or rush Mm -hmm. you know there's it's whatever's there that week um it's it's a different environment and it's right uh, the thing about theaters anyways is there's a benefit to rolling laughter in a big crowd. Right. So you can you can ride a wave on a bigger audience. Right. There's a diminishing return on that though. Because the drift of, of your voice and timing by distance fades. So let's say I tell a joke in a place that has 600 people in it to the back of the room. Okay. All of those people see the same timing on the same joke verbally and physically they can see me i'm close enough they can see my gestures my the Mm -hmm. you know the Mm -hmm. whatever i'm doing with my face Mm -hmm. sure they can hear the timing of the joke tied to the last Mm -hmm. sentence so the timing of the words very important once you get further than that each row has a drift and after about a thousand people it's really just riot control yeah you know, posing as comedy yeah. after a while. Like, it's just weird. And you see it with all the giant shows. The rare occasion where, like, um, I would say, like, Eddie Murphy, Delirious, which was the album Comedian, that's as big a place as stand-up should be in. Right. And that's about 3,000, I think, was the size of the space he was in. Really? 3,000? And that's... And I've done... Like, I opened for the Bee Gees on on Y2K at Panther Pavilion in front of 15,000 people did stand up for them and then did the countdown for New Year's. 
And you could feel it was like performing comedy off the deck of an aircraft carrier oh, facing wow. the ocean. Wow. Like you just heard the waves of laughter go back and then return to wow. you because I sonically don't even hear the laughs of the last joke until I'm on to the next one Jeez. because that's how long my voice traveling to the back of the room, making them laugh, and their laughter, the sound of it in group, you know, getting yeah. back to me was. So it's really an odd experience. Does that throw you off? Because you have a you have a very uh, quick punchline humor. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, so so I, I, I bulldoze. Okay. I believe in bulldozing. I believe in 90 minutes worth of comedy in a 60-minute set. Yeah. And always. I my, my thing in stand-up, like I have some rules for my own performance, and anybody who's trying it, I always give them this advice. But you should always have three times as much material as you have time on stage, no yeah. matter what you're doing. Okay. Because that's great advice, actually. Yeah, because the 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 audience may be with you on one night and everything flows and it all pockets together. Sometimes they may diverge and there's all kinds of like offshooting groups and people who are, you know, came in late and noise and, you know, mm -hmm. people who get uh, turned off or turned on specifically by one particular bit mm -hmm. where they don't hear anything else. Right. You should have enough in the you know, in your backpack that you can mm -hmm. pull out and mm -hmm. solve that problem instead of burning the 20 minutes of the show you want, you were planning on mm -hmm. doing, mm -hmm. you should have st enough stuff to get them back on track mm -hmm. so that you can finish your show the way you want it. If, especially if you're building an hour and you want to do a special with it eventually, it, you know, you craft that stuff over time. Yeah. So you've got to have that and you can always, it's better to cut down than, you know, so when you're when you're getting ready to record a new hour, in your example, you said for every hour you need three hours. So if you're writing a new hour, does that mean you need four hours? No, I have about three hours worth of stuff, which is the next show and the show after that that are oh. kind of grinding in there. So after I finish something, I don't have to go back to any of the bits I was doing. I already have worked them out. Yeah. I've rolled them through and then said, this is good, but it doesn't fit in this show. I'll pop it over to another thing mm -hmm. and hang on to it for a while. And so I have like... I get a good 20 minutes at any given time that hasn't found a home yet, but is what I consider gold works really well is reliable, strong material. It just needs a, to be couched in something else or, or paired with another chain of thought yeah. that makes it make sense to the audience for an hour, yeah. you know? And now when, then when you do acting, do, do, would you say uh, as an artist acting has helped your stand up? Like just, they were never divergent. Never they were, divergent. there was never a, a variance in there because a lot of my comedy is informed by comic actors as well even you know like as a stand-up i grew up on you know prior and carlin and and uh and a bunch of really kind of random people like uh gilbert you know, like uh, like gilbert godfrey yeah well like gilbert godfrey was kind of like his own act he's become something else and you know but the version of him in the 80s was much more like just a character act like bobcat mm -hmm. goldthwaite or right. one of those, like mm -hmm. i came up on those guys and sam kennison and like but a lot of my performance was informed by people like gene wilder mm -hmm. and and him pairing with richard Pryor and their comic acting together right. the stuff they did on screen versus what richard did on you know i was affected by more of like richard's early stand-up before he became famous and then his comic acting afterwards. Like, yeah. I would argue that, like, Live on the Sunset Strip and those kind of things are great, but they are more him just TMZing himself mm -hmm. at a oh, point yeah. in his career. He's just talking about being famous and shooting his car and his experiences. Just, like, personal stories that we would now just have some jerk with a camera find out by following you around and treating you like crap in an airport parking lot. <laughs> the the sure. real Richard Pryor stuff and why he's crucial to comedy is from stuff like Black Ben, uh, Black Ben the Blacksmith, and um, uh, you know, was it something I said? And Hank's Place, mm -hmm. the early '60s, mm -hmm. early mm -hmm. '70s um, albums that are indicative of what he is as a stand-up. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, but largely forgotten in the wake of his extraordinary acting career and performance career as a as a film star right to most people yeah. you know it's hardcore stand-ups we you know we know that's that what work. people yeah yeah it's kind of like uh like bill cosby uh no one knows he did a movie that was terrible oh well i mean he was bill cosby <laughs> yes right not now um they slept through it um 
<laughs> but uh, and I, what's our rule on swearing on this? Oh, everything. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, okay. So I think um, it you comes know, out balance checks, right? <laughs> oh, I, I had a, uh, you know, I, have a, I, I talk in my act about this, no. about this sort of state of comedy currently. It comes up um, only because nobody cared about comedy until it became dangerous again, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, and I, I say the one thing we learned from the Cosby affair is never trust a comedian who won't say fuck. Oh. Because clean comedians are are monsters. Oh, if you can't fuck. in stand up, if you can joke about anything, yeah. as long as you can make it funny, mm-hmm. you're allowed to talk about any subject in the world. So oh, imagine yeah. choosing not to discuss a topic in front of an audience if you have the comedy skill to do it, yeah. the writing chops, and especially if it's an integral part of people's lives. So, and you go, I'm not mentioning that. Okay, why? Oh, yeah. Be- I'll tell you why. Because the only guy who doesn't think to make a joke about a body in the trunk of his car when he's pulled over by the cops is a guy with a body in the trunk of his car. <laughs> that's the only dude who hasn't yet, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, like, uh, yeah, officer, don't move the body when you look in the trunk. Like, that's <laughs> something normal. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody who's sweating and going, God, why would I even mention a body in the trunk? That's ridiculous. You know, uh. is clearly a murderer and there's going to be thumping and screaming coming from the back seat. So, uh, you know, uh, that's always been a question. That said, Co- uh, Cosby's skill as mm-hmm. a performer mm-hmm. was v- incredibly refined. Oh, my God. And, it, you know, and is, it, he, he's a tactician mm-hmm. comedically. And it's, mm-hmm. it, you know, and himself is to this day like a, a, a classic example of the art form. Right. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. the irony, the mm-hmm. irony that mm-hmm. those of us that grew up in that sure. era, you, we were told Prince and Richard Pryor are dirty and scary and evil. And Bill hey. Cosby and Michael Jackson are the clean ones. <laughs> Honestly, wow. yeah. it's just th- exactly th- what th- like, think of that. Think of, mm-hmm. I mean, if there's any reason for an, any authoritarian streak in anybody it's that mm. is that the dude who was in who i saw for the first time live and he was in a see-through raincoat and panties <laughs> was was ultimately became a jehovah's witness was a you know was a hardcore christian at the end of his life in right. terms of prince never had sex with anybody who wasn't begging him to have sex with them. Like, right. beyond consent. Like, these women were, please, please have sex. You know what I mean? It was kind of like Elvis in the 50s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, sure. there, you know, I grew up with, you know, in the world of, like, hair metal and the like. And, the, and there was always this idea that hair metal was this act of misogyny and it was just dismissive of women. But if you listen to the lyrics of hair metal, it is all enticement. It is all alluring. These are all guys dressed effectively in androgynous clothing, largely dressed, you know, uh, in, you know, Just, beyond gender norms, as we call it in the right, modern that's vernacular, right. That's right. saying, I got what you want, sure. not you can't leave unless I let you. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was, it's a very distinct difference that I think a lot of people just kind of write it off as, you know, whatever. But like, even the protagonist character in Seventeen by Winger, which is one of the standout, like oh my god, those people back then songs, <laughs> is this is this girl with far too much sexual agency who doesn't spring this news on this dude until it's too late. Yeah, is the idea, and and this is not like I'm gonna go out and find me a seventeen year old. That wasn't the song at all. The exact opposite. The dude's like, uh oh, you know, and that's the story, right? Yeah. Um, so. To me, there's uh, that those distinctions are important and have been lost nowadays in our like. I have a shelf in my house that says evil and a shelf that says good, and I put people on either shelf and they just stay there. There's no middle ground, you know. Yeah. Like that world is absurd, childish, mm-hmm. and cartoonish, and I I feel like you know we reality still is reality but the way people talk about it online it looks like they craft their thoughts with crayons and hammers oh my god tell me about it like i'm on twitter and regardless on whatever political view someone's on 
they just go nuts. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, holy shit. Dude. Oh, they get pillory, <laughs> you know. I um, <laughs> You especially. I see oh, yeah, you. but <laughs> I don't care. I do that to draw fire. Right. Because I, I know a lot of people, you know, and, you know, I've got a radio show where I talk politics and all this stuff, and a lot of my listeners catch fire when they try to say stuff and the, you know, the, the Twitterati come after them. So what I basically do is just stand up, say a version of the thing that everybody's thinking that right. isn't bad, but because of uh, the language police... People oh. immediately assume its <clears throat> meaning. Yeah, they, you know, there's a group of people who I, believe that if you draw a blue line on a map, it magically makes a river. And th- I'm here to tell you that's no. that doesn't happen. Yeah, that's not true. Yeah, and and the, a lot of people think that though. Yeah, in good for good and bad, if they go, oh, I drew a blue line. There must be a river there now. Yeah. Oh, or oh my God, he drew a blue line on there. He's flooded the entire area. Like it doesn't work that way. Words are words and you need to mm-hmm. allow them to be just that. So, I, you know, I do that. I stand up and I don't care. Yeah. And and I, like even today with Warren bowing out, you know, mm-hmm. I'm there was all this talk about its misogyny and its anti-woman mm-hmm. and that's why she was forced to drop out and two angry old white <clears throat> men, blah, 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 are the main people. Right. One of whom, by the way, was the vice president of our first black president. So, but yeah, never mind. Um, <laughs> but I was making the case, everybody kept saying it was misogyny and I was like, mm-hmm. Sexism plays a part, but it's not the primary part of it. And right. telling people that it does is a message to women, especially young girls or women coming up, that it wasn't that she was a flawed candidate or that she didn't manage to drive home her message or satisfy some of the other voters' concerns about her. It's just that she was a woman. Imagine saying that to every woman in your life. Uh, like, look, it's not that you lost. It's that everyone hates you. Right. And I know you think some people like you, but they don't. They yeah. all secretly hate you. That's the kind of language an abusive lover mm-hmm. uses when they're trying to keep mm-hmm. people right. from, you know, from hanging out with their friends or mm-hmm. talking to their family. Yeah. It's hideous. And so I pushed back on it because I'm like, no. It, it, sexism was a part of Elizabeth Warren's issue, as was Kamala Harris's, as was Hillary's, or whatever. But it wasn't the main reason why she mm-hmm. didn't take root. Mm-hmm. Right. It's it's the reason why women in general have a problem in politics, but it wasn't the main reason why Warren mm-hmm. didn't cut through. It's just no, not. I actually condemn them for like actually running, though. You know what I mean, like that, because in the history, mm-hmm. you know, no women ran until the past, you know, eight or ten years. You know what I mean, like Washington didn't run against a female. You know what I mean, like that's mm-hmm. when. That's what I'm saying. I, I don't understand what you mean. Well, I'm just saying, like, that, that's cool that they're they're running. Because oh, you can you, there's yeah. a, you commend them, yes. you know, not I, condemn them. No. Oh, no. Did I say condemn? Yeah, you said yes. condemn. Oh, I meant commend. Even okay, I, was yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was yes. confused. Holy shit. <laughs> right. That's, that's, a, that's <laughs> yeah, you said, very I, important I point. I condemn them yeah. for running. Yeah, I said, yeah, like, God. Yeah. He just said no. commend. That's no, not what I'm supposed to. Oh, Ladies and gentlemen, oh, call up the t- Twitterati. He meant it was a typo. It was a verbal typo. Please stand down. Defcon oh, one. Defcon one. Like if I ever blow up, a new this video game. could give me a trouble. Oh, done. It's, it's oh a dude, new- they don't even need the explanation. They're never going to hear this part. They're, all they're going to all they're going to hear is that one sentence. Oh, just rather forget really about it. Just, oh. Yeah, good it's, luck getting a job anywhere else. That's being a, spliced right now. It's a new video game. That's right. I, yes, you oh at them. Yes, and I get that. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's <laughs> we got to edit that out, right? No, leave it in. You, otherwise, oh, the rest of this doesn't make sense. And then I'm defending someone. <laughs> then it but, sounds like I'm know. like, no, reverse yourself, say condemn. <laughs> like you know, uh-uh, you don't get to do that to me. It stays in. Hal, don't you find this interesting? And when you take power, just power per se, in any position, you know. It's genderless in the sense that no matter who you are, man, woman, and anything else, when you give an order, like, you know, say, say it's war, right? Mm-hmm. You have to drop a bomb on a village, mm-hmm. and the woman, you know, the woman ordered it, a man ordered it, and anyone else did, the bomb still went off and the people died. Mm-hmm. So I always thought, you know, it, it's what will happen anyway. Well, with the, the, when the is, order is the given, is, it doesn't matter. Right. Well, the theory has been for a long time, and that, I mean, there's an argu- uh, argument that there's an effective soft form of sexism in the in the idea that if you put a woman in office she won't bomb people at the rate oh, that a man does that right <laughs> beyond the fact that you know margaret yeah. thatcher being what she is yeah, um if anybody wants to <clears throat> see what you know, a woman in power is capable of and power is always a weird word for me i have to yeah. be honest like that get, word gets bandied about okay. now especially because you know power is two things power is control right we use that as control but it's also 
how we source energy. Mm-hmm. You need mm-hmm. power to run lights. You sure. know what I mean? There's an element of it's it's one of these malleable words that can mean whatever anybody True. wants it to mean. True. But most of the time, it's a denigrating thing. You want to be you want to be in control of other people, yeah. and make them do narcissist. And, yeah, and I. I don't buy it. I mean, I think there are public yeah, servants sure. out there who go, I would like to be president totally. because I think I could do a lot of yeah, good. Sure. And the, yeah. the idea that they're seeking power for no, power's no, sake no. is either projection on the part of somebody mm-hmm. who right. has an evil heart that they don't want to deal yeah, with. We're going back to the, the, the example. Yeah, right. exactly. But, <clears throat> but like, do you, do you know who Olga of Kiev is? Olga of Kiev is one of my favorite, like, it's, it's a mild history lesson, but it's pretty great. Um, all you need to know is there were two countries right next to each other in, in Europe, and, and uh, Kiev was one of them. And, the, and this woman, had a, she was the queen. She had a son. The son was going to be the, king, the next king after this king dies. You know, everything's running fine. They're dealing and trading with the next uh, country over. Her husband goes over to do a trade deal with this country. He starts jacking up the price on some stuff. They don't like it very much. So they kill him and cut him to pieces and mail the parts back to her and say, we've killed your husband and we're going to take over your country. And you have a tr- your son's never going to be a king, but if you want to survive, we're going to marry you to one of our princes. So you just have to deal with that fact. Uh, he's going to come over. You're going to marry him. We'll own your country and then your people won't have to be enslaved and murdered. And she go- She waits a week. And responds and goes, cool, okay, but just be peaceful about it. Otherwise, my people will rise up and it'll be an issue. So send over the prince and 20 of your advisors, because that's how we do it over here. Right. Send over your, your minister. Of, we'll be there in a minute, dude. Just give it a, a rest. That's um, the five-minute light. <laughs> right. Do, um, yeah, for the story. Um, <laughs> do, get, you know, um, They send over their minister yeah. of agriculture. Mm-hmm. They send mm-hmm. over the minister in charge of making mm-hmm. sure the water works. Mm-hmm. You know, All those mm-hmm. the smartest people in this other country. They all come over. She, they arrive at the castle two weeks later because it's a long ride. She, she goes, the prince can come in first, and then you guys can wait outside. And then after we have our little ceremony, you guys will come in afterwards. They, she spent the last week digging a trench inside the gate. The prince comes in. They capture him, crucify him in the square. The rest of his people come in afterwards. They all fall into the pit on stakes and w- filled with oil. She sets fire to all the smartest people in this other country. Right. right? All the people who make sure shit works yeah. are now dead. The prince, she makes him write a letter... She's like, you'll live, I'll let you live if you write this letter and say, you know, send over your um, your lords uh, as a, you know, to, to escort us back safely to the country. Right. And we'll come over together and we'll have the marriage ceremony there. So he writes this letter. She slits his throat and pushes him into the into the pit with everybody else. Jeez. Two weeks later, they get the letter. They're like, oh, awesome. Things are going great. <laughs> Son wrote a letter. Everything's fine. Sure. Send over the ministers. They're going to have oh. a big party for him, and then they're all going to bring her back, and it's all going to be cool. These ministers show up. They go, you guys must be tired from your horseback ride. We've set up the bathhouses for you. Go on in there. <laughs> um, you know, Disrobe. We got all these ladies in there for you. They're going to help you scrub you down. Midway through the bath, all the ladies are gone all of a sudden, and a bunch of dudes run in with buckets full of oil and talk. It on the water and they burn these fuckers oh, alive. Wow. It was like Game of Thrones. Wait. Then she takes all her people, her ministers, her warlords, her folks, they all ride over to this other country with all her forces and go, All your people are dead. Your son is dead. Your ministers are dead. All Everybody who knows how to run your country is de- dead and burned alive. Here's their heads, by the way. Uh-huh. So here's what's going to happen I'm taking over your country and you're just going to have to deal or whatever. She lays siege to the main city. They won't come out. Finally, she, they give up because she starved them out. She goes, look, I'll let you guys live peacefully. I'm not going to kill the king and all these other people. You just come out. And all I ask is everybody in the country gives me a, a token of their sincerity that they're going to live like normal people. I want a turtle dove, uh, three turtle doves and three pheasants. Pheasants to eat, turtle doves, uh, they're used, I mean, that's the internet of the day. They use mm-hmm. messenger pigeons messenger. for everything. So they go, oh, shit, we're getting off easy. Yeah. This, this crazy woman is going to, you know, she's going to let us just give her three, sure. th- six birds from every household. We're fine. So everybody lines up for days. A whole country rides in from the countryside, gives her three things. Madam, thanks for not murdering us all. Excellent. <laughs> Here's your three turtle doves. Enjoy the pheasants. They're good, better grilled than fried, whatever. <laughs> and then they all go back home thinking all right it's cool everybody's crazy who runs this fucking dump so she'll be just the another in a long line of war lords 
That night, she has her soldiers attach packets of sulfur and flint to the fucking bird's feet, releases the turtle doves, and because they are messenger pigeons, they all fly home and burn the whole fucking country down. <laughs> that I mean, that's oh, Olga of Kiev. Yeah. Like, oh, there is no difference between wow. men and women as rulers and their capability. Everyone has the spectrum yeah. of capability and cruelty and all that stuff. We Our goal has to be to civilize people and pick the best people for the job who will handle the real crisis that come before us. Yeah. And, and just saying you're a peacenik or a pacifist when shit happens isn't going to solve it all the time. You have to be able to answer all those questions. Well, how, a good than that, I have no I opinion. I like that. Olga. How are Olga up? Kiev. No, she's don't the, want to go oh, out with yeah. her. Then go look up Jean de Clisson, the French <laughs> uh, 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 leader. She was great. So we, how we got to get going because we got the red light. But where can the folks at this home was, follow you? Um, HalSparks.com. There's all my tour dates and all that kind of stuff. Um, at HalSparks on Twitter and Instagram. And, of course, um, if you want to watch my, you know, I stream my radio show on the internet, so I do it uh, at infotainmentwars.com. Oh, that's cool. We have the documents, and uh, <laughs> even though we don't need them. And um, so that's my YouTube channel, so ah. people can subscribe there and all that kind of stuff or whatever, and they can always, you know, I'm one of these Patreon guys that pays for the Patreon awesome. Thank mm-hmm. you so much, Hal. Yeah, wow. absolutely. Yeah. Rock, rock Sorry rock. I went blank and didn't have anything to talk about. Oh, my God. This was the best <laughs> conversation ever. Uh, if you guys like the show, subscribe, rate, and review on Apple podcast at Razor the Riffs and follow us on social media and uh, follow Hal Sparks guys thank you guys so much thank you Hal mm-hmm. wow you're listening to Razor Riffs with Keith Razor and Alan Lee right here on LA Talk Radio